Um, so, hi everyone. Welcome to this panel discussion on collateral freedom, using global trade to change sensors and incentives. Uh, so before um, before I get started in substance, and boy, I'm not as I hope you're better at ignoring that than I am, because um, I'm struggling. Uh, but before I get started uh, in substance and introduce the amazing panel that we have and dive in, I just wanted to speak to kind of method for a minute. So you'll notice that there are four people up here in six chairs. Um, I am bad at math, but that's not the reason why there are extra chairs. Uh, there are extra chairs so that people in the audience can come on up here and join the conversation, fishbowl style. Uh, and the, I guess the way that that works, the way that that works is that um, anyone who wants to can come, can come sit. We're going to do just a brief initial uh, uh, contributions from each of the folks that are seated up here. And then as soon as uh, we're done with that, people can come on up and hop in. And the, the, the protocol is that for these sort of two, I guess they're called hot seats in the, they call them hot seats in a fishbowl, which seems incongruous. But um, you can tap someone on the shoulder who's not speaking, who's in one of these pairs, and switch places uh, with them. I hope people will pop up and join the conversation. Um, I should also tell you that I'm uh, very aware and am quite chagrined that despite having taken a pledge personally to be more aware of gender balance on panels at tech conferences, um, <laughs> I have ended up organizing a panel that is all men, and I am, I can only say that I've uh, that, I, that I've fallen for it and that it's a, yep. both a learning experience about the planning process and also a, ref, a reflection on how many amazing people who are here uh, I don't uh, yet have sort of on my radar and I'm so glad to be meeting people. Um, and with that, um, I, I will just start. Um, so my name is David Robinson and I am part of a small team of technologists uh, in Washington. Uh, there are three of us. Uh, and we work on uh, a variety of issues where computer science expertise is needed by leaders in nonprofits and in government. Um, so we're called Robinson and You, uh, following the Washington Convention of Extremely Creative Names for Organizations. My partner is Harlan Yu, who some of you may, may know. Uh, and um, we uh, had the very great privilege and pleasure to work with the Open Internet Tools Project on a report uh, that surveyed uh, users of censorship circumvention tools in China, in mainland China, and Collateral Freedom uh, was the name of that report, reflecting our core finding. Um, and we'll come back to that in substance, but let me just introduce uh, these amazing folks. So, uh, Jim Cowie, to my immediate left, is the CTO of Renesis, which has, many of you will recognize that name, uh, the name of the firm from uh, some of the most informative blog posts that you've probably ever read on internet freedom that are not only at Renesis's own blog, but also uh, their graphics end up all over the place because they really do occupy a unique niche in terms of tracking the transnational flow of data amongst autonomous systems on the internet. Uh, and uh, we're all very fortunate to have uh, their help in illuminating uh, behind what can often be theor theoretical and rhetorical conversations a bunch of salient facts. Um, and I feel very lucky to have uh, Jim with us today and he'll talk a little bit about some of the inferences that they uh, have been able to draw from some of what they have observed. Uh, to Jim's left is Ox, who is one of the, who's, who, who, of course, Ox is a pseudonym and a literary reference, which he, he may uh, uh, illuminate for us. Uh, Ox is on the development team for Lantern, which is a relatively recent addition to the arsenal of uh, purpose-built censorship circumvention software tools. And finally, to his left, Steve Schultz, is a program officer for internet freedom at the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department, which means that he is intimately involved in the grant-making activities at State that support the development of internet freedom tools. Um, and so having just, 
just introduce, let me just uh, do a little bit of stage setting uh, and then let, let these folks uh, weigh in. So we, uh, when we were doing this report on uh, collateral, what became collateral freedom at the end of 2012, we basically used a snowball method, snowball sampling method, to survey about a thousand uh, mainland Chinese users of censorship circumvention tools. And I'll tell you what I expected we would discover, what I expected they were going to tell us, is that the most heavily encrypted tools that were purpose-built to empower people to circumvent barriers like the Great Firewall would be the most widely used. But uh, what we found, and the report is online and I would encourage you to, to, to look to it, um, what we found was something close to the opposite, actually. Um, Tor, and what we did, we had very limited time with each person because we, uh, of course, uh, you know, we, we didn't want to be paying them, we didn't want to be tracking who exactly they were because it's a hidden population and we didn't want to be putting them at risk. And so we figured that whatever we asked them, it had better take less than five minutes for people to complete. So what we ended up with was a list of tools going down and then columns going sideways for, I've used this tool within the last 30 days, I've used it more than 30 days ago, or I have never used this tool. And what we found was that um, most of the things that I thought would be the most widely used, in fact, had lots of former users. Um, so Tor had lots and lots of former users, but only a handful of current users among our respondents. And again, snowball sample, hidden population, not statistically representative, no one knows what the sampling frame is, so take it with a grain of salt. All that said, um, we did have diversity across a number of dimensions, including geography and the, the, the seed sources from which the respondents were referred, and the, all the findings that I'm going to describe and that are described in the report were consistent amongst the seed groups. So that is uh, some non-statistically robust data which is consistent with the possibility that this is representative. Uh, but we, again, are not really in a position uh, to know. Um, but the, the, the thing about it was that when we looked at what people were currently using, i.e had the most users in the within the last 30 days time frame. The, uh, the, the single most widely used tool was something called GoAgent, which is a proxy server that runs on top of Google's App Engine infrastructure and is actually designed so that if you are a user and you want to circumvent censorship barriers, you basically pretend to be a software developer and upload this prefab machine image um, to Google where, of course, as a developer, you get a free sample of their amazing infrastructure and can run a server for a little while before they start to charge you. And so this is a system designed so that you go ahead and upload that server and what you have is a proxy server in Google's cloud. Now everyone thinks, oh, it's Google, so it's blocked in China, right? And the answer, it turns out, is that it's complicated and some of the things that especially businesses rely on uh, are not consistently blocked in China um, and in fact uh, continue to be uh, uh, reachable and the bad is because of the, and this it gets into details of how uh, Google's encryption is implemented, but the bottom line is that if you can reach any part of Google's infrastructure via a secure web connection, then you can use that connection to reach any other part of Google's infrastructure, and uh, GoAgent takes advantage of this. Um, we know that if the Chinese government wished to block all data flowing to or from Google, that it's technologically trivial for them to do that. They know which IP addresses they would need to drop the packets uh, to or from. Um, and similarly, after GoAgent, the runners-up in terms of most used tools were VPNs. And again, we have actually seen a demonstration that uh, the Great Firewall can block VPN traffic at the protocol level, meaning that without knowing in advance which servers are VPNs, they can look and see who's making a VPN connection and block them all. And they did it for a period of hours or days um, some months ago. And you know, they don't do that either, even though it's clear that they know how. And there again, what you're seeing is something that we observe, well, you know, VPNs are relied upon by business who are integral to the foreign direct investment that comes into China. And for that reason, the opportunity cost of disrupting them 
is quite high. And that's where sort of we felt that we really learned something through this, through this survey research, which is that apparently uh, economic disruptiveness or economic importance, how much disruption would be caused by blocking this tool is a better predictor of its efficacy, at least in China specifically, as a circumvention tool, than the degree of technological stealth that it brings to the party, because these most, these most um, effective tools were not the stealthiest. And we've seen some exciting uh, further discussion of, uh, of, this sort of, of this idea of what it might mean for uh, future work in internet freedom. And uh, I think with that, I'll, 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 uh, I'll turn it over to Jim to uh, offer some thoughts from the, from the, from the Renesis perspective. So, very good. It's, uh, it's an interesting topic, this idea of collateral benefit. That, in, in, in a sense, what it means, if I, if I understand the concept, is that by people doing what they're going to do anyway, in other words, be self-interested and selfish and make money, that censorship goes away as economics forces uh, people to act in ways that promote an open internet. All it requires, all, in big scare quotes, is that an open internet be pitched to the right people as the economically sensible, self-interested thing to do. So let me back up and say a few words maybe about how Renesis approached some of this problem with data. If you don't know Renesis real well, um, basically what we do is we study the routing of the internet. We study the performance of the internet from a very large number of places around the world that we uh, uh, have either hosted as machines or these days we've installed as virtual servers. Um, attempting to figure out basically the complete map every day, everybody who's connected to everybody on the internet at a provider level, and also to understand the pieces of the address space that they are um, bringing to the internet. So sort of what does everybody bring to the party if you think of the internet as a big global party? Um, so every day we rank all the providers in the world, who's the most important in every little nook and cranny of the world. Um, so we did a study, and we had a, an interesting hypothesis, which was that there was a quantity called frontier diversity that would be important um, in understanding how vulnerable a place was to be disconnected in one flash, like the Egyptian shutdown, um, or, or the, the entire country of Syria going off the internet all at once, right? Countries aren't supposed to leave the internet all at once. They're supposed to kind of trickle out, they have regional damage, and somebody cut a cable. But um, we, what we did was very simple. Um, we took every autonomous system on the internet, and we tried to assign them to a country, if they could be. So somebody like Google is not, somebody like Level 3 is not. But somebody like Turk Telecom is, that's a Turkish AS. So we classified all of these into their country of origin. And we said, pick any country. How many of those uh, providers in that country actually have the demonstrated ability to do business with somebody outside the country, like directly? And in the routing table, that's something you can just look up. You find it. You say, well, here's Turk Telecom. I see them in the routing table talking to Telia, uh, talking to maybe Deutsche Telecom, talking to Tata, talking to whoever. And we say, good, they're in the camp of people in Turkey who can speak to the outside world. They have contractual relations. We said, let's just count these. Simple counting, right? I, I don't have a great statistics background. Um, and we tried to see whether there were obvious cut points. And we found out that, uh, well, basically what we did was we imposed a system by which um, if you have one or two providers that can talk to the outside world and that's it, that's really a severe risk. That would be places like uh, Yemen or Syria or North Korea. There's just there's one game in town, it's one provider typically, and if they decide to turn off the internet, the internet's going to get turned off. And it goes up from there, you put a cut point rather arbitrarily at 10, uh, at 40. If you can make it past 40, uh, then you're a country like uh, Canada that has so many providers that have individual relationships with foreign providers that we hypothesize that such a country is less likely to be at risk. And we looked at that over the course of the next year. And if you go to our blog, you'll see some of the results that we came up with there. And it, it does seem to bear out that the, com the countries that have left the internet by and large are the ones that have a very low degree of frontier diversity. So, that's something concrete we could take back to the community in every country and say, um, what's going on here, if you look at it in the right way, is that there are specific
companies in your country that are rent-seeking. They have struck some deal with the government. They have some monopoly right. They're the only licensee for the international gateway. And while that may work for the government and it may work for that company, it's not the best thing for everybody else uh, because it makes the entire country more susceptible to accidental shutdown if nothing else. It also makes you more susceptible to cyber attack. It also makes you more susceptible to government shutdown. The point here is to talk to the business community to find them, all the people who are not that guy at the frontier, and say, banks, content providers, uh, you guys have internet that's terrible, and it's largely because you can't directly talk to the outside world. If that case could be made to enough smaller providers in every country so that they could petition for redress and say, we want to buy international services from level three. I don't want to buy it from Telecom Egypt that resells me a circuit from level three at some market. Then the hypothesis is that more and more countries would be dragged up this hill towards increasing diversity. And then hopefully, regardless of what specifically happens day to day in terms of policy and regulation, you would have that reservoir of diversity so that in case something were to go terribly wrong, um, you would have enough fallback connectivity to the outside world to, to survive that, to be resilient, and to continue offering banking services, to continue trading on the London exchanges when you know, your internet connection is, is fragile, but then it fails over to your backup provider. I want to stop there, because uh, I think that's the basic, the basic concept. But, uh, hopefully that falls into that collateral category. Um, so the, uh, the Lantern Project is a pretty good uh, censorship circumvention tool, and uh, the whole collateral freedom hypothesis has been very central to, to the work that we do on a daily basis. And we're actually very grateful to you, David and Alan, for, uh, for, the, for the work that you've done at AM. Um, you know, when we, when we look at the world, um, we concern ourselves with a very particular kind of censorship. So if you look at a country like China, for example, um, they censor an in-country uh, through their relationships with ISPs and companies. Providers, and that's not really a problem that we're interested in tackling. What, what we're looking at is what happens when transit national boundaries, right? So you've got somebody inside of a sensitive country who wants to get access to content uh, outside of that country on the open internet. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and in order for that to happen, um, basically all the different solutions boil down to more or less the same thing. You need something outside of the sensitive country that we call a proxy server. Um, you need some way for someone inside of the sensor country to learn about the existence of that proxy server. Um, you need often to get that person software that they can use in order to communicate with that proxy server, although that's not always the case. Um, and once that person starts using that proxy server, you need to be able to communicate with it in such a way that the sensors can't figure out what's going on and subsequently block that proxy server. So on a day to day basis, our, our life is really deep concerned with keeping. Uh, these proxy servers unlocked and figuring out ways to get them to people um, that the sensors can't uh, decide and can't block. Uh, so to all these collateral freedoms is, is very important. So specifically, uh, the way that we get our software out to people is by sending them links to email, which works because email tends to be unblocked because if a country blocks email categorically, um, doesn't even cause a lot of collateral damage. Um, once they have that link, we're able to distribute them the software via Amazon's S3 servers. Uh, which works for similar reasons to uh, what David was uh, earlier explaining about Google's app engine, although slight, slightly different. Uh, but the basic point is that the only way that they could prevent us from distributing our software in S3 would be to shut, uh, shut down all of S3, which would impact a lot of businesses. Um, once our users have that software, they communicate with our proxy server using protocols that look more or less like the protocols that people use when they're just surfing the web. Uh, so there we are essentially hiding in plain sight, which again works because the sensors are unwilling to just categorically block web traffic because that would have severe consequences. So, so really at all levels, collateral freedom is, is extremely important. But really the reason that it works is because of um, sort of structural features of the network, and, and specifically because a lot of content, both that they want to censor but also that they don't want to censor, is actually outside of the national network. So, so when we look at developments that are happening, uh, for example, with, uh, with Amazon opening up uh, a version of their Amazon Web Services service in China, um, one of the things that we want to make sure it doesn't happen is, is a balkanized internet. Uh, because the, the more that content and services can be moved into the sensitive countries, the lower the collateral damage becomes uh, from blocking these. So that if 
the amount of traffic that's transiting national boundaries gets too small, um, then you can just shut it down, and there's nothing that we can really do about that. So, uh, so that, that's really how we look at the collateral freedom and the work that we do. And uh, it, it really impacts a lot of the censorship so I can mention tools. And there's, there's a lot of head sort of community coming together and now looking at ways that we can take advantage, especially at the protocol level, of, uh, of things that, that are being used for quote unquote legitimate uses. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, as David mentioned, I'm Steve Schultz. I work at the State Department. Uh, I work within the uh, global programming and in government. Programming means grant making. Uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of code words. <laughs> um, uh, and so, I have a couple of remarks uh, in my current role. Um, but I also wanted to take a step back because before joining the government, I was an academic and. I'll throw out a few ideas that are maybe chum for more conversation and maybe we can get some folks up on stage to discuss them as well. Um, from where I sit, uh, we uh, are very excited about this notion articulated by the Collateral Freedom Paper, um, I think being actively experimented upon by projects like Lantern, uh, by other projects like I'm sure some of you are familiar with the folks at Great Fire. Um, and free Weibo that are uh, experimenting with different techniques, seeing how repressive regimes respond, etc. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's a powerful approach to anti-censorship, um, tying that policy consideration back to the economics, back to um, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, benefits, uh, uh, the fiscal benefits. Uh, to regimes and to individuals, finding ways to make those interests align. Uh, and I think it's also important, and this is where I'll start to drift a little bit into the, 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 the higher level uh, ivory tower uh, uh, pontificating, but I think that um, it's important to know to note that the, the economics of the internet are at once familiar and new. Um, I think that the economics of the internet, so we have, economists have this notion of network effects that is an idea that's been around for a long time around different products. The idea is uh, the more people that come onto a particular platform, the more value the platform has as a whole. So the more people that buy fax machines, the more valuable buying a fax machine is because you can talk to other people, you can send faxes to other people. Um, and you see this a lot in information technology of various sorts, but in other e e economies as well. Um, the internet adds another layer, or layers to that, quite literally, um, in that um, we have the infrastructure layer, uh, we have the content layer, and we have other logical layers in between. And innovations are happening at all of those different layers, and those are adding to the value, the economic value and the social, political value of the network. And uh, in many cases, I think when repressive regimes seek to shut down activities on the internet, when they seek to censor, they are trying to uh, avoid, they're, they're, they're trying to stop the activity that they don't like without uh, stopping the additional benefits, some of which are often unexpected benefits, you know, spin-off ideas that never could have happened if we didn't have the, this core infrastructure of the internet. Um, and so the question is, uh, are there ways that we can structure uh, the way that the internet works, our policies around the internet, uh, that make that kind of picking and choosing more difficult? And, you know, historically, one of the policy considerations we've had, and I'm not primarily a policy guy, although I, I'm happy to talk policy, but one of the, one of the primary policy considerations we've had uh, when it comes to the internet uh, around the world is uh, access, universal service, as we call it in the United States. And we heard this morning about how, of course, still more than half of the world is not connected to the internet. Um, access to the internet is critical, uh, but it's also critical, getting back to your point about balkanization, that um, that access is uh, true access to the whole internet. So it's not just universal, it's, I don't know, it's unitary access. Uh, maybe that's not the right word, something, something along those lines. But that access to the internet means access to the internet. Um, and 
in many cases, I think that the repressive regimes that are trying to shut down access to information, um, access to different tools for communication, are trying to break that unitary notion uh, without breaking, um, breaking the, the notion that individuals have access to some network. Um, so I think going forward, the question is if a collateral freedom approach is going to be productive and really effective, um, how do we make those that would seek to pick and choose the ways in which the internet is used and usable feel the full force of that collateral damage? The collateral damage of uh, the network effects, the collateral damage of the unexpected uses that they're not going to be able to experience. Um, I don't have a perfect answer to that question, uh, but I think it's uh, a matter of realigning, uh, again, the economic incentives uh, with with those specific decisions, so that so that um, the the do, doing good and doing well in this case um, end up aligning with each other. And sometimes we can make technical decisions, and sometimes they're policy decisions. I'll mention one of my favorite RFCs of all time is RFC 3271. Um, uh, Vint Cerf's "The Internet is for Everybody," um, which I would uh, commend to everyone, uh, which is uh, really a policy statement in. Uh, technical clothing. Um, but I'll leave it at that. I, I kind of threw a bunch of ideas out there. I, I wish we could compare notes on our favorite RFCs, <laughs> but uh, I'm not prepared to. People can come on up uh, who'd like to join the conversation. And in the meantime, I'll just say that uh, Steve mentioned uh, the work of greatfire.org, and I would like just to make sure that we're all aware of the beautiful work that they are doing. Uh, so in specific, what they did when Reuters and I think Bloomberg, but several Western media outlets were blocked in China, what they decided to do was to mirror the blocked content at an Amazon URL. So you have to imagine that this is HTTPS, secure aws.amazon.com something, right? And the, the beauty of this is that although a sensor can tell that encrypted traffic is going to this Amazon web address, um, the sensor can't tell which data it is. And so the sort of difficult choice, uh, as Steve was indicating, uh, is whether to block the whole thing or not. Another example of this was a list of engineers involved in the creation of the Great Firewall, which was censored but then was mirrored onto GitHub. And there was a brief period where the Great Firewall blocked connectivity to get up, but as you might imagine, this caused an uproar among Chinese software developers um, and only lasted about a week. And now, uh, at least as of the last time that I heard about this, GitHub uh, is readily accessible in China, including uh, the secure page on GitHub that has this list of these engineers who some people are saying, you know, should be denied entry to the United States and so on. Um, and so I, uh, I think that it is exciting to see people deliver, and I should say, I mean, Great Fire, they've, they've, they've said, look, this is why we're doing this, is that we think this is going to work in a different way. So, you know, I see it as, as a strategy that is being added to you know, the strategic uh, uh, arsenal. I, I think also that one place that it's taking us is toward more attention to cloud providers um, who play a central role in all of this. And I think um, that for people in the room or elsewhere who either are working for or working with these organizations, they're in a position to uh, have an enormous impact through just the basic engineering decisions that, that they make in a way that at least for me, having worked on the survey, was um, a, a definite shift of, uh, of perspective. Um, but, uh, and so I'm just, should I just stop talking until someone stands up? Is that the right way to? Rebecca. <laughs> yes. I, I nominated Rebecca. Can I do that? Um, I'll just talk from here. I'll borrow some. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sorry if I'm sniffling a little bit here um, while I talk. But um, just, just to elaborate on the, the Amazon Web Services, um, greatfire.org um, case, because I, I think it's interesting and it sort of points to 
some questions about where that's going to go. So as, as you said, gratefire.org kind of helped a couple of news organizations and a number of other organizations mirror their, their block sites on Amazon Web Services based on this principle that you know, too many Chinese companies are using Amazon Web, web Services for the Chinese government to block the whole thing, and therefore, you know, this is, this is a good tactic. But now we have an announcement that came out at the end of last year, Amazon is moving its business into China, right? Which is then going to place the company under Chinese jurisdiction and so on, and that's, that's where sort of the Amazon collateral freedom kind of principle starts to fork from, say, the GitHub uh, collateral freedom principle, because GitHub doesn't have a commercial interest in China, right? It's not kind of salivating about all the business it can do in China and all the profits it can gain by doing business with Chinese companies. Amazon, you know, sees a big untapped, you know, market in China, wants to do a lot more business with a lot more Chinese companies, but in order to do that, there's, there's a worry, you know, amongst those who have been using Amazon Web Services, not just Great Fire, but others, it, you know, to, to host content that they want to keep unblockable, that the Chinese government may say, okay, you want to come into China? You now need to respond to our requests to take down certain accounts or, you know, to to cancel certain accounts or, or whatever, you know, or to hand over information about certain users or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's when a company starts having a big business interest in a country, even if they're not hosting the content in that jurisdiction, they start having to make compromises. And you've seen this with quite a number of other companies. And so there is a question of whether Gratefire's Amazon web hosting strategy is going to work you know, as Amazon gets further along. And, you know, Amazon, you know, it's not a member of the Global Network Initiative. It hasn't been willing to kind of have dialogue or sort of make public commitments around, do they have a process for handling government requests? Do they have plans to do transparency reporting? Do they have plans to have dialogue with the human rights community about how they're gonna handle data? how they're going to handle takedowns, you know, how, how they're going to handle these issues in a responsible manner, they are not among the companies who are having that conversation. You're not going to see them here having that conversation, I don't think, as far as I, I, I haven't seen any evidence. Um, and, you know, so, so that's a real problem um, that as some kind of seemingly unblockable companies start to get pulled, um, you know, how long can that last? Now, we, we've seen Google actually make some commitments, which is why, you know, I, people are still using those services, but it's, it's tricky. And so I'd be interested to hear um, some of the panelists comment on this. Um, Grenade insights, uh, thank you. Um, at, at this point, you know, the, the, the rollout of Amazon Web Services in China is still very early stage. It's by invitation only. Um, you know, from reading the announcements and reading the documentation that they have, you very much get the feeling that they're still kind of feeling it out and kind of, you know, figuring out what exactly they're going to do to scale this thing. So I, I don't know how many conclusions we can draw at this point. Uh, but a couple of interesting details I, I would share with you that you can interpret as you wish. Uh, one, Amazon will not, per the announcement, be owning or running the infrastructure in China. They're actually partnering uh, with local companies and ISPs to handle that for them, uh, which has potential implications for their relationship or their lack of relationship with the Chinese government on that front. Um, and the other interesting bit is that they are segmenting, at least for the moment, that service completely from the rest of the international AWS offerings. So, you know, when you use AWS, you sign up, you get an account, and with that account, you can manage all of the different servers and services that you deploy with AWS all over the world. That sign-in doesn't work for China. You have to create a separate sign-in. What exactly that means, I'd be speculating, but it's an interesting thing to think about. I'd actually like to speak to that. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
about your microphone or about that, since you were saying you were sniffing. <laughs> um, so, any company that's going to host content in China. Sorry, could you identify yourself? Oh, Mary work on Adobe Systems. Um, mm -hmm. I used to be with Yahoo, and I used to oversee Yahoo's international law enforcement oh, okay. stuff, right? Okay. Including disclosure of content in China. Um, and, you know, if you have a server on the ground in China, you have to comply with Chinese law. That's the price of entry, and there's no way on earth you would be able, you know, could you imagine if um, a foreign company came to do business here in the United States and the U.S. government showed up and said, you need to disclose content consistent with U.S. law, and they said, no, sorry, we're not going to do it. You'd go to jail, um, just like you would if you have staff in the of China. Now, with Amazon Web Services, you know, they are partnering with a local company just like everybody else does. Microsoft, when they rolled out um, Microsoft 365 and China partnered with 21 Bionet. That's a requirement. You can't launch a hosted service in China um, unless you have a local joint venture that's 50% um, or less owned by um, a U.S. national. Um, I guess the question that I have for you guys is, um, I mean, it's just as a practical matter, walling on China has been very economically effective for China. Um, I mean, you look around the world and companies that haven't walled off the internet in the way that China has, haven't developed competitors to the U.S.-based market in the way that China has. You know, Sina, Sohu, Baidu, you know, it's an extraordinary market, and by protecting that market and only letting players into that market that comply with local regulation, and with the U.S. government letting China into the WTO and not compelling them to allow cross-border traffic consistent with WTO obligations um, has just exacerbated the problem. It's let them have the economic benefit of the wall off while becoming a member of the WTO. And so I'm curious to see, I mean, to hear from any of you, I mean, I'm not seeing anything that suggests that the Great Firewall has been anything but a great economic benefit for China. And we see all kinds of other countries looking to follow China's lead, like Brazil, like India, like, you know, the BRIC nation, um, Russia, all looking to this model of being able to control the traffic in their jurisdiction, the speech in their jurisdiction, and the additional economic benefit because they're blocking off the competition. I would, yeah, I would, I, I would, uh, so I think that's an excellent, it's a, it's a great point about the, the trade barriers issue, and this is something that USTR, you know, has, made a request for consultations with the Chinese about their WTO, WTO obligations for free trade and information services. As far as I'm aware, uh, it didn't go anywhere because what WTO victories uh, allow you to do is impose retaliatory tariffs. And the bottom line is that the United States is not interested in getting into reciprocal retaliating tariffs vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese, even if, because of their derogation of WTO obligations, we may be legally entitled to do so under the WTO treaty framework. Um, but I think, and I, I mean the balkanization concern, I would, I would uh, without in any way uh, apologizing for or smiling upon the, those sort of latter and, and newer balkanization efforts that we're seeing out of places like Brazil, I would distinguish those from what we've seen in China in, in, in a couple of respects that strike me as being likely to, 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 to matter. I mean, one is that, um, as far as I'm aware, the, 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 the Brazil, uh, well, I guess, yeah, you could ask the question. So if they say, you know, users have to put, you know, if you have Brazilian users, you have to store their data in country, and Facebook says, well, that's not our practice, then what, right? Is Brazil going to block, is actually Brazil going to block Facebook? As far as I have heard, and I don't know, maybe others, I don't know if you've been following, I don't know. I'm yeah, so, 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 I mean, so do, is this something where they're saying, you know, people in Brazil are saying, look, if you don't put your servers here, we're going to block Brazilians' access to your so servers. So the dialogue is still ongoing about what the remedies would be if you don't put your servers in Brazil. The challenge really is in the Brazil situation is that companies like Facebook or like Adobe or like Microsoft who actually have staff on the ground there, if they don't comply, they have people that can go to jail. The people who are in the clear are the folks like the GitHubs of the world who don't actually have staff on the ground in Brazil necessarily, and so you can flout Brazilian law without having anybody on the ground to pay the price. So, I mean, that's really where the difficulty lies. I mean, at the end of the day, if Brazil decides that it's going to say, no, you know, you need to host content on the ground or you can't do business here, 
the folks that actually are going to have to comply are the folks that have staff on the ground or allowed to choose to leave country and try and operate from offshore. And then if anybody gets what they're supposed to do about it, it really depends on how serious they are about enforcing a regime. Yeah. I'm curious. Oh, we've got a. Can, can I piggyback on that and then? Is this a t Sorry, I, I, I don't know the meaning of the hand signal. Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. Thank you. Oh, thanks. I'm sorry. It's my job. <laughs> <laughs> so, are we going until quarter? Quarter well, past. After, after that, down to the hub. What? After the twelve minutes, we've got a thing going on at the hub. Okay. Okay. Great. I was just curious from the from the Renesis perspective, looking at frontier ASs, if a China looks significantly different from a Brazil, looks significantly different from some of the other places where we've seen these types of proposals or proposals in this family floated. Right. So one, one thing I've heard a lot of today, just sitting in various sessions, is this concept of the uh, the elephant or the unicorn, right? The, the, the outlier in the series who is so large that while they dominate the conversation, the, the physics of the internet don't apply to them in the same way as everybody else. So Google, Facebook, these are the, 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 the whales of content. China is definitely the outlier in terms of the fact that they've achieved critical mass and they've managed to keep the frontier basically closed. And yet, when we look at it, we classify China as the lowest risk category for disconnection. And partly that's just the numbers I'm supposed to play straight with my model, which says there are a lot of autonomous systems in China, and actually there's a reasonable number of them that, mostly because of Hong Kong, have what looks for all intents and purposes to be direct connection to the outside world. Uh, although most intermediation of the internet in China is dominated by the big carriers. Um, it's, it's a little unusual in that we actually have, we have to resort to other means of detecting what potential impairments and economic problems and fragilities may be lurking there in China. We just had this big example of, uh, there was a huge DNS problem in China shortly ago, um, where there's a great firewall glitch and everything was blocked, briefly, and then everything was unblocked. Uh, and that's a, 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 for us, that was a, a footnote in our model that said there is structural richness in China's economy lurking there, ready to be diverse, but at the same time there's this uh, it is truly one of a kind system imposed from above, largely in the, the blocking of DNS. And let me just sort of pick up on that too. I think one of the real questions here is outside of China, what other countries that are tempted to censor are susceptible to these dynamics in such a fashion that you, you could really think about closer coupling between freedom traffic, for lack of a better term, and commercially significant traffic as a uh, promising approach. And I would look to, you know, potentially middle market countries where competition for FDI is, you know, is, is keen and is a high priority in places like Vietnam, for example, as potentially promising places in terms of providing you know, and some of it is pretty basic, right? I mean, everyone has Amazon, but has anyone taken, you know, um, stuff that's in that, the language of that country and made it available via this mechanism? Uh, you know, that's, that's, I think, a question that could be asked about a number of, and I think, you know, I mean, Brazil's an, is a fascinating case because, right, they're, they have this appetite for investment. I think, you know, if, if, if the sort of sad story of balkanization takes off, you know, then we have a subsequent question, which is, you know, to what extent do these other countries have the kind of bench of technical talent that China has that allowed it to rebuild, essentially, replicas of so many of these services? And, I mean, perhaps Brazil does, but, uh, I mean, there are probably a lot of countries in the world that don't. And now, Danny wants to say something. I want him to have a microphone. Sure. Oh. So... I remember when you first, um, so I'm Danny O'Brien, I, I work at the FF, and I remember when we, we were first talking about this, that one of the attacks against um, the Google-mediated censorship system that we came up with was China dropping off censorship circumvention tools for lots of American school children, so that that would force the Google to actually fix their system because schools would complain that their own censor was going to be got round to. But more seriously, the censorship 
a lot of what this hitching a ride issue is really an issue of can the sensors peel off the content from this valuable content. And there's two parts to this. One is clearly there is a economic incentive for them to do that because it lets them complete a policy that they're pursuing and keep the, the good bits flowing. But the other thing, I mean, one of the, the most worrying developments in pervasive censorship that we see is actually not about the expansion of censorship, but the narrowing of it. So that, um, you know, if you block YouTube, a whole country rises up as one and wants their cat videos back. But if you can, if you can block a narrow URL, or you can block some other image, it's one of the reasons HTTPS is so important, then it, if you minimize the effect to everything else, um, then, then it's a better censorship system from their point of view. And it seems to me that this, this approach falls into that subset of something that they know they already have to do, which is to peel away um, the bad content and, and, let, and, and actually cause a limited amount of collateral damage for the other materials that, they, that they, they, they're targeting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, it's, it's crucial that we have uh, a, a way to make, make that harder. And I mean, I think it's in some way, it's a different, it's a, sort of a slightly different gloss on, uh, on what the challenge is, is how can we make that kind of narrowing, you know, harder to do? And that's why, and that's why it, as you said, HTTPS is so, so important. Um, uh, but I mean, I, I wonder whether there's, are other, do you guys have? Oh, sorry. We're just we're just we're just playing musical microphones. <laughs> this one works as well. Yes. Um, so so one of the one of the interesting things that we look at for the Lantern project, but uh, you know, we're still fleshing out the story here, but we're very really interested in peer to peer. Right? So a lot of what we've been talking about today is the traditional sort of client server. You know, somebody wants to access sort of a big site hosted by some big company or what have you, um, and, and that that also tends to follow the kind of the pattern of what you see in core environment. What companies like to use because that sort of centralized infrastructure provides nice control and security features and what have you. Um, peer to peer is interesting because, in some ways, it's more difficult to deal with if there's collateral damage. Right? If you've got all these different nodes on the internet, um, some of which might be legitimate, um, that, that becomes a more challenging problem for the sensors. The, the problem that we have right now is that there aren't a lot of business users for a peer to peer, so the collateral damage is low. So something that I personally would really love to see, and I'm curious if anybody has thoughts about uh, what potential applications might be, but it would be really nice to see sort of an explosion of peer-to-peer -peer usage by business, um, because that might actually uh, you know, increase the, the viability of, of those types of mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll just kind of quickly follow up on, on that point uh, by saying that one thing that's interesting about the peer-to-peer -peer angle, I'm sorry, I'm Adam Fisk, from, also from Lantern, uh, is just that uh, not only is it the case that there are these companies that have services that remain unblocked because there's this collateral damage, but you also have BitTorrent that's unblocked in all of these regions. So there's this collateral damage to blocking even things that aren't necessarily seen initially as economically important but in the case of China, may actually be particularly economically valuable from the perspective of the Chinese government not having a vested interest in protecting U.S. copyright law, for example. So you have this huge influx of value into China uh, by keeping BitTorrent unblocked. Um, and would you speculate that that has entered maybe into their thinking on whether or not to bother with blocking? I don't know. I don't know, but I think it's interesting that that's the only other example I can think of of a service that stays unblocked, and I'd have to guess that it is due to the same collateral freedom thesis that there is is cost to blocking it. And certainly, to, to, to another sort of maybe else like a weaker form of that hypothesis also would just be that these are folks who know how to filter and block and impose constraints inside their domestic network. I mean, arguably they're the world leader among countries in so doing. And and yet you don't see any effort at all to, to, to block this 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 peer-to-peer -peer infringement activity. Um, Let me ask a 
Maybe I could ask a question back to the collateral damage group. Um, some of the, the work that we've done has involved uh, IP reputation, right? So the reputation of particular blocks, this is often seen as security context. You want to know, um, for example, if I'm given a fresh allocation of IP space at which to run a service, I want to know, has that block been, you know, is that fresh and clean, or has it been really driven around and used to send spam? I would imagine that um, the collateral damage concept could, unfortunately, could go the other way. That somebody who has a very valuable, high-value service might say, legitimately, I don't want any of you guys up next to my IP address space, you know, close, in, close by addresses, um, because of the potential that I'm going to attract uh, blockage because of who you are. Do you ever, do you see that as being a concern on behalf of the cloud providers? It makes logical sense. I have, but you know he's been pushing back. I, I have a, an example that is strangely similar to this in that I noticed that LinkedIn has just opened a, 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 China, a Chinese operation. And um, I remember they were, earlier on, they were making discussions about whether to send servers in or how they were going to deal with the Chinese market. And one of their big problems earlier on was that their, one of their biggest features in the West was that you could connect your Twitter account. And the problem was, was that uh, folks in China were using LinkedIn as a way of getting a mirror to Twitter that was blocked. So LinkedIn was actually being blocked because it was acting as, as an a, a underground railroad for, for, for tweets. And, um, uh, and so the question that they were asking is, well, should we shut this off? And of course, you know, our response is no, keep it up. But the wider cost <coughs> is that at that point, LinkedIn as a complete service was going to be, was going to be blocked in China. I don't know how they resolved that, but I know that. I think remotely. And complying with Chinese law. They posted a blog post last week. I, this is what uh, I was referring yeah, they posted, to. But they're posted locally, and if anybody says anything on LinkedIn that violates Chinese law, even better groups look at a law enforcement. So I, think, just, I, just think they, they, I think they're Chinese service has limited features. Right. Like it doesn't so, offer all the features that I, I think, the rest of LinkedIn has. I think that was actually the solution that they went to from that period, which is they were basically created a sealed off walled garden within their service so that uh, um, China, uh, people coming in from the Chinese mainland um, didn't have access to what the rest of the service offered. Just a little quick in terms of the IP address question. We, we haven't got any complaints. Uh, was there a uh, question in the back? Yes. Um, I'm Anne um, and Sarah. I'm actually a journalist. I've worked previously over in Hong Kong and China, so I've covered a lot of Chinese and China issues. And I have a question for, for the gentleman from the Hanson, whose name I forgot, um, is about not blocking full countries, but cutting off regions. And that's interesting in Chinese, because some of the Tibetan regions, uh, the Sichuan, that have just been cut off the internet. From what I understand, it's sort of different than how the Great Firewall technologically works. So my questions are twofold. One, can you see in countries where the blocks are not countrywide, but regions, maybe separatist regions? And two, to what extent can this collateral argument be used to promote internet access in regions that are usually economically marginal and politically troublesome to nations? So uh, I think I, I'm not sure if I caught both questions, but sure. to, to this question of specificity, yes. We can track things down to the city level. We had a great example uh, in the Venezuelan instance recently where there were some routing outages, very brief, but they were affecting a particular province, the province where all the problems were, and it turned out that they, we believe that probably the government had taken off, one of their main facilities was inside the address block that was unrouted, and so it was quickly put back up. So uh, it's true, you can't you can exercise fairly specific control over which region you want to affect, which city you want to affect, uh, which specific DSL provider, provider by provider, obviously, and yeah, we, we see that a lot. The, the model that we made was really about country-by-country uh, 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 country disconnection, the sort of uh, the, the kill switch concept. We moved into that, but you're right. It's a, it has become a much more subtle game since Egypt, uh, as many people have pointed out. All right, so I think we may have time for one more uh, question, if there's a last one, or uh, if not, I will thank everyone. Uh, for uh, for, uh, for being here, and uh, if people want to talk more about this, oh, I'm sorry, there. Sorry, maybe last second, but the EIP value thing. Uh, so, oh, I'm not sure if you would cite 
uh, we were denied service by Rackspace when we tried to get hosting with them. Uh, no real reason given. I mean, maybe we were we would be violating terms of service, or maybe they didn't want us hurting their their other customers. Uh, also, I too I wonder. So, uh, sort of variation on that. If there's a danger of us tipping the collateral value on, in some cases, for example, we use DigitalOcean, Landry uses DigitalOcean. They're pretty cheap. We're all pretty poor. I bet some of the other, I bet some of the other organizations like us use DigitalOcean. I have no idea what percentage of their total user base, client base, we are. But there might come a point where just blocking DigitalOcean's IP space might become. Not a collateral, not sufficient collateral damage. And, and by way of final comment, <laughs> I do <laughs> want to refer back to Rebecca's comments about how sustainable these current experiments with collateral freedom are and to what extent they align with business incentives because I think a lot of this will come down to not just um, how do we uh, proactively try to align freedom and freedom traffic, for lack of a better term with the economic incentives of nation states, but with very large companies that operate within those jurisdictions and face issues with people on the ground. Um, so likewise, we need to look at the alignment of economic incentives there, and I agree that we have a looming potential challenge. Thanks to everyone, and we're all still interested in this stuff after the panel, so feel free to continue the conversation. Folks, thanks everybody. If I may. Up the hall.